Hello, welcome to the very second episode of Learning to Drum. The past two weeks you saw what to buy, whether or not if you should buy a drum or a drum pad, uh, what kind of sticks you should buy, and then of course we talked about the history of those sticks, how they made them, and also the history of the practice pad, and we had our first guest on, Kelly Ray Tubbs. I'm your host, Adam Tevlin, and this is Kai Tevlin, and uh, thank you so much for joining us again. If you're new to this program and you haven't seen the first episode, which is in two parts, I encourage you to go back and watch that. So that way you have a good foundation uh, of where we're starting from. And then also I want to remind you that we're coming from a Western perspective. Now this goes back to actually Europe and the medieval times in a country called Switzerland was the first to record drum rudiments, which we're going to be talking about later. And so now that we have our sticks in the hand and a practice pad in front of us. I hope you've gotten the chance to go out and buy your sticks and to buy your practice pad. If you don't have a practice pad just yet, that's okay, because what we're going to talk about really is about how to hold those sticks and then the different types of strokes. So let's talk about the different ways that you can hold the sticks. And there's two main grips, Kai. There's the traditional, you've seen me play like that, mm -hmm. like which... <laughs> I guess it. No, okay, we'll talk about that later. Let's go to match grip. That's the one that I taught you. And let's just see your match grip. Remember to relax. Okay, great. So the match grip is the most popular grip. And that's what I'm going to recommend for you to use. However, I play both, traditional and matched. And there has been an age-long argument, which is better, which you should do, which you should not do. And it's just a, a false argument. You, you really, it's, it doesn't matter if you play traditional or matched. And within the matched grip, there's different versions of it, Kai, in which I'll, I think I've explained to you in the past, you know, mm -hmm. so let's talk about those different versions of the matched grip. So you have the German grip, which you're kind of doing right now. Oh, really? I'm doing the German? With the thumbs on the side of the stick there. Oh, okay. wait, I thought it was a... Okay. Isn't it an American grip? Not yet. Okay, and then your sticks are supposed to be forming a 90 degree angle. Okay, so make sure your sticks are at a 90 degree angle. Is your sticks at a 90? No, nope, that's more of like a 45. Let's do the 90 degree. I'm showing you the German. Oh, man. Yeah, there you go. Now put them down. And that is the German grip. Now, Kai, also there's different versions of that, okay? Because there's the ones where have, you have the gap in between the index finger and the thumb. So now you're resting in the first knuckle of your index finger. Mm -hmm. Okay? You want to try that? Something like that. It's just a much looser grip. Okay. I use this uh, sometimes in, in orchestra, you know, when I'm playing with the orchestra. And then also, there's the closed grip, which is what ta is taught in contemporary marching or drum corps, mm -hmm. right? So you like don't, you always like... I put a stick in, in between that gap, okay? And so, ladies and gentlemen, not only are we coming from a Western perspective, but also what I've been taught uh, prior to, and a style that I've developed, or, or I guess I just, you know, called it this over the years, which is the gelatin mold effect. And the gelatin mold effect is when you're very strict with the way you're gripping your stick, the movements that you're using when you're doing your different types of strokes, and the reason for that is it builds up muscle memory in a quicker amount of time. And you also incorporate different muscles that you normally would not use if you had an open grip. So, we're not saying that the open grip's bad or, or you know, we're just saying that that's the approach we're taking. And this is the approach that I was given in, when I was starting to learn drum corps style under Michael, Michael Anthony Davis who's the co-founder of Freedom Percussion, and he was telling me no gap. The point I'm trying to make, though, is that the German grip is just one form of the match grip, and the French grip is the, where the thumbs are on top of the stick. Wait, do they actually do it this way? Yeah, the motion is this. Really? Uh-huh. Wow. The only problem I have with the French grip, really, I mean, it's very useful, because it helps you use the fingers. It feels awkward. feels very awkward. But eventually you're going to want to use that and channel it. Okay? The thumbs are on top of the stick and the sticks are parallel. This is also called timpani grip. Okay? 
Now, the only problem I have with this Kai is that you try to go ahead and, and no, you got to keep the thumbs on top of the stick. There you go. Now, how far can you go up by just doing those motions? I can do barely the tip. Kind of right. You can, yeah, that's almost getting out of control there, right? Mm. So if you notice that you only have so much movement. Now let's go back to the German grip and you have your sticks at a 90. Mm -hmm. There you go. And so now let's see if you can move up how far. Oh, that's the American grip now. Oh, We're going to talk about that in just a sec. But how far can you move up on the German grip? Oh, that's the American grip. Oh, <laughs> You're so used to doing the American grip. Okay, let's go back to the German grip where your sticks are formed at a 90 degree angle. Okay, and then when you move up, the only problem that I have with this grip is a certain amount of extension. With the American grip, that's the combined two of the French and the German there. Go ahead and let's try the American grip now. There you go. Yeah, now that's what you're used to. And yes, Kai is getting now full motion in both sticks. So this is the form of match grip that we're going to teach. And we're going to talk about the traditional grip very vaguely. I play both styles. I haven't taught Kai the traditional grip, so I recommend everybody to play the match grip. If you want to play traditional, that is your business. There's different versions of the traditional grip. The traditional grip goes back many years. That Western tradition was passed on by Europeans when they came to the Americas. And in one country in particular, one of the first to record rudiments was Switzerland. And in Basel, Switzerland, you can see here their version of their grip. That tradition or that whipping-like motion, eventually that tradition got to the United States. One of the most known educators in early drumming was Sanford A. Moeller. Notice his grip. Two fingers on top of the stick with the left and on the right hand thumb tucked underneath. Here's a much later picture of him this goes back to military drummers and the purpose of the drum themselves. Here's Coldstream Band 1790. Notice again the thumb tucked behind the stick. And of course the Spirit of 1776 or Spirit of 76, that's Archibald Willard's painting there. And you notice again the elderly and the younger drummer both have their thumb tucked. So that is just one version of that right hand grip. Here's a picture of a medieval drummer and you notice that his first finger is only on top of the stick. Again the thumbs tucked behind the stick. And that left hand version of the traditional grip didn't die out because you can see here in this picture of contemporary drummer of the band The Police, Stuart Copeland, who's taken up this form of the traditional grip. So you can see there's different variations of the traditional grip. So again, we're going to play the American grip style. Our sticks are at a 45 degree angle. And we're going to keep the gap in between the index finger and the thumb closed. If you notice, uh, if you're having a hard problem with this, one thing that you could do is just hold out the palm of your hand. You want to try to hold out the left palm. Of your... There you go, yeah. All right, great. And then go ahead and just lay the stick in the palm, but the stick lines up with the tip of the index finger and the end of your palm off to the side here. Okay, now what you want to do without moving the stick is just clench the stick. Okay, now that's okay if you're too far up on the stick. Now I want you to take a look at what this looks like. If you notice, the knuckle and the tip of the thumb are parallel or even with each other. Now yes, we have a problem with now what's called the fulcrum. The fulcrum is the point on which a lever rests or support it and on which it pivots. What I want to make sure and you want to make sure is that the stick is rested in between the knuckle of the index finger and the ball of the thumb. When you strike the drum the momentum force that is moving forward from your strike gives a opposite but equal reaction pivoting that stick back up into the up position, which is a stroke that we're gonna learn later called the free stroke. If I had my sticks like this, I have no rebound, okay? If I'm all the way back on the stick, I hardly have any rebound as well. So for the Vic first sticks like Kai has, is that you have an American flag here, 
on every stick and approximately this is where your thumb is supposed to be. Uh, you can move it up a little bit, a little bit back. It depends on, on the age of the person, the, the types of sticks that you have and everything, but primarily, usually, we have that thumb on the side, side of the American flag there, so or the Vic Firth American flag. And let's go back to the American grip there. Again, our thumbs are off to the uh, side at a 45, pointing at a 45 here, right? It's not totally on top or totally off to the side. It's, it's right there at an angle. So there's different types of strokes that we have. And again, I come from a marching background. And so I was curious, and I didn't find out about this actually until much later in my years, is where did my techniques come from? Who were the forefathers or mothers in, in Western drumming? You know, and it was passed down by generation to generation, all the way goes back to Europe. It goes back to a country called Basel, Switzerland. And in Basel, Switzerland, as you've seen in the pictures, they had a very different grip. And they have a tradition of where the thumb is on the tucked underneath the stick. Yeah, and well then and then you had more of a a whipping motion. Okay. Yeah, because the military drummers had to be loud. They had to be really, really loud. But over the years, somehow it morphed where the thumb is on the side of the stick. And that was very recent, okay? That probably had developed between a cross between the orchestral style and, and the marching style because drummers in the olden era of, you know, 16, 1700s, 1800s, they were not the only drummers around. There were orchestras around in that time too as well. And when the snare drum actually was one of the instruments coming up as a popular instrument used in the orchestras, they had their own technique. And so I wanted to figure out, because I've played in the orchestras, because I've played in drum corps, because I've played in marching bands, and as well as jazz bands and other things utilizing the drum set, I wanted to figure out where this all came from. I did my research and over the years I found out that the whipping like motion with the thumb tucked underneath the stick there is Sanford A. Moeller. And I also realized that the orchestral where there is a gap you're using more fingers is Billy Gladstone. And then the other person that I noticed was George Lawrence Stone who talked about rebound because I'm a very firm believer in utilizing the surface that you have so you don't have to work as hard. We get back to the American grip and ladies and gentlemen go ahead and try that on your own and we're going to talk about the different types of strokes. Now in, in drumming education things have different terminologies they have different ways of explaining different approaches so I just want to let you know what I've gathered over the years and the different types of strokes that I'm using are primarily just different movements that I've told people, whether or not if I'm instructing the marching band or getting people prepared for marching band. When you're playing any instrument, you have a starting position. And in the olden days, when you're marching, people had a starting position up here. And this is how you started playing. Whether you started your rudiment in front of a judge or your drum solo in front of a judge, it was in an up position. Okay, so this is an up position. There it is matched. Okay, but we're not going to play like that. So the position that we start at, and this is what marching band and drum corps do, is the set position. So when I say set, that's where everybody needs to be. Either in this or sticks in. Okay, but for right now, since you're not doing marching band, some of you might not be, we'll just start in this position as set position or home base. This is the foundation where you're always going to get back to. And I have five strokes that I teach people. First one is the silent upstroke. The silent upstroke is just simply bringing the stick back and you're allowing the back three fingers to open up with the stick opening up those back three fingers. That's a centripetal force, if you can say that correctly. There it is. Yeah, that's pretty good. Now let's not go too much to the side because you just want to come straight up. 
Yeah, right. and remember, American grip comes straight up. There we go. Now let's do the left hand like that. Once again, that's all the silent upstroke. It's, it, it's pretty much preparing you to play. Okay, now this could be a full upstroke. This could be a half upstroke or a low upstroke, you know, but primarily we're just going to go high all the way up. Just like lifting weights, you'll go all the way up and all the way down. You don't just go like this. So for right now, we're going to go all the way up and all the way down on our upstroke. You want to try that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. So you can see how the centripetal force of the stick would open up those back three fingers. Okay. So that silent upstroke can be now turned into a free stroke. And a free stroke is just nothing more than a rebound stroke that allows your stick to come back in that original position. Ah, whoops. That's okay. Yeah, let's try that again. Remember, it's like throwing a paper airplane to the ground. There you go, good. Throw that paper airplane to the ground. Throw that airplane to the ground. You want to try the left? There you go, that was a good one. Oh. Yeah, and if, if you get a little bit out of whack on your stick grip, that's okay. There we go. Okay, now the reason why I have my back three fingers still open is it actually gives me two options. One is I can come down to another stroke, which is called a downstroke. Yeah, and that's all it is, is getting from point A to point B, from top to bottom, from up to down, the downstroke. Yeah, now the important thing is to not let that shock stop here at the wrist. You want to go all the way up. Now remember, keep your thumbs on the side of the stick there. There you go. There you go, good. You know, I also call this the snap. The reason why is because you're snapping your back three fingers. There you go. Yeah, and if you notice that the this, this shock does not stop here in my wrist. It actually moves up throughout my body. And if you don't allow that to go throughout your body, you can actually develop wrist problems. Recapping of what we were doing, we have the silent upstroke, the free stroke, and now the downstroke. And now the last two strokes are a tap. Can you just tap? Yep, that's all it is. Okay. Now some might call this a low free stroke, some might call it a low down stroke, it depends on how you play it, okay? But all it is is just a tap, okay? So the last stroke is the tap up stroke. Tap and then you come up. Tap and you come up. Tap and come up. Tap, you come up. Tap, you come up. Tap, you come up. Okay. Yeah, and the common mistake is to kind of do one of these. Okay, you don't want to do that, right? Just tap, come up, tap, come up. All right, so let's recap. So you got the silent up stroke, I'm ready to play. Free stroke, down stroke, tap, tap up stroke. Now I'm back to the original position, which is my up stroke, okay? So don't worry about if you can't get a hold of this. Feel the sticks in your hand. Try to get used to a hold of them. Remember what I said, the American grip. Uh, we have the 45 off to the angle here with the thumb, as well as the 45 angle in your sticks. And our extension is full extension all the way back. Okay. So that's really kind of what you just need to really be focusing on now. Uh, because we're going to get a little bit more into detail on each individual stroke, okay? So obviously we talked about all the different strokes. You know, one of the things that we're gonna be talking about first, foremost, is, is that free stroke, that rebound stroke, and trying to learn how to rebound off the drum or the drum pad. And I think it's important that we do that and learn about that because without that rebound or without knowing how to utilize that, a lot of the different things that you'd wanna play are not gonna come across very nicely because you're gonna be playing stiffly and we don't want stiff playing. So, you know, Kai, I was talking about the early, I guess, educators that I found out who were utilizing, you know, whether it be this whip motion or finger motion, 
you know, and rebound. Those three people, again, the whipping motion, you know, was Sanford A. Moeller, who came from that traditional military drumming style that dates back to, at least to the 1300s, back into Basel, Switzerland. Also, George Lawrence Stone talking about the rebound. So things have a rebound, and therefore it can give back to you for free. So you want to utilize that. And then also, lastly, is Billy Gladstone, who was mostly utilizing the fingers, but he came from the orchestral era. So I was trying to combine these elements together, what I've learned in the marching drum corps, and of course, what I've learned in playing orchestral music, and obviously that transferred to the drum set. What I was wondering, though, and, and I've talked to a really nice individual who is deemed the global ambassador of drumming. Yeah, I mean, global ambassador, meaning he travels around the world talking about not only the history of drumming, but also the techniques that is used throughout time. And his name is Dom Famulero. Kai, what do you think? Should we give him a call? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. But we got to do, we haven't done the, the, uh, the clap in a while, have we? Yeah. So you remember on the first episode, on part one, we did that hand clap. It was about our very first rhythm lesson. Well, let's go ahead and see if we can do the, the hand clap there. Uh, do you remember what it is? What is it? Uh, something like that. Okay. All right. I'll count you off. Right. Okay. You're going to do it with us or what? All right. Here we go. One and two and ready and play. And... Hey, Dom. Thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show. The first episode of Learning to Drum was about the sticks and the pad, what to buy. Kelly Ray Tubbs graced us with her presence of the history of the practice pad. And I know the second person I needed to go to was you because you have a tremendous history of your teachers and who they studied from. And it goes back to these three, what I call founding fathers of Western drumming, that would be Sanford A. Moeller, Billy Gladstone, and George Lawrence Stone. So welcome to the show, Dom. Thank you so much, Adam. It's great to have Kai with you there, too. This is exciting. Absolutely, yeah. Kai's been studying with me for a little bit now, and that's okay. So I've always given the approach of, of I'm not going to force it on you, and if we're going to do it, we're going to do it right. If there's anything that, uh, you know, Kai, you wanted to ask Mr. Dom throughout the course of this interview, you're more than welcome to, okay? All right, excellent. So, Dad, talk to me about your lineage and where you came from, and how does that all go back to those three founding fathers? Well, Adam, thanks so much. You know, it's kind of interesting. I um, live on the area outside of New York City called Long Island. And by living here, I grew up about 20 minutes outside of New York City. And I was able to have access to so many great drummers great, great legends that performed in New York City. So a short train ride or a short car ride, I was in New York City during the 1960s and 70s. It was a time in New York that had so many music clubs going on and so many bands happening at all the times. And some of the bands were small group, some of the bands were big bands. It was such a wide variety. And I was able to get the tail end of the big band era mm -hmm. to hear Stan Kenton. Count Basie, Duke Ellington, all these great Woody Herman, these great, great big bands that were performing actively towards the end of their career. Buddy Rich's big band, Louis Belson's big band, Thad Jones, Mel Lewis' big band. These were some great, great, great music here in New York. And I was 1971, I was 18 years old. I had met up with Shelly Mann and heard him play at a club and it blew me away, and it was just, he just played so great. And then I heard Max Roach perform, and Max Roach played, and he played so great. And after Max had performed, the club had emptied out, and people were kind of leaving. And Shelly, a uh, band happened to have to be in the audience at the time, and I see Max Roach. Shelly goes up and shakes his hand, thanks him so much for playing, and Shelly leaves. And now I'm in the club by myself with Max Roach packing his drums. Wow. So I'm like, so I walk up to the stage and I said, excuse me, Mr. Roach, I, I just want to shake your hand. 
Now, Max Roach was probably the drummer that created bebop drumming and such a master at his craft. So I shook his hand and came down. It was just so great to meet him. And I said, Mr. Roach, I said, my gosh, you, you played so great. You had such incredible freedom when you played. Whatever you thought in your mind, you were able to play. How do you develop that kind of freedom? And this was early in 1971. And Max Roach looked at me and leaned down and said, Billy Gladstone, George Lawrence Stone, Sanford Mole. Wow. He gave me three names. Now, I kind of knew Moeller because, you know, Jim Chapin lived on Long Island. I had heard him playing around some clubs. And I kind of knew of George Lawrence Stone because of the book that he wrote, Stick Control. That's right. yeah. And Billy Gladstone, I, I kind of heard his name from Shelly Man, but I didn't really know who he was. So I said to Max Roach, I said, well, who are these guys? He said, they are the absolute forefathers of drum education. They were the guys that analyzed drumming, and all of their students were all of the great drummers that we knew of today. Max Roach, Buddy Rich, Louis Belson, Gene Krupa, Papa Joe Jones, Philly Joe Jones, Sonny Payne, Rufus Speedy Jones. These are names of drummers that were the best of the best playing out all the time, and they were students of these guys. Mm -hmm. I said, wow, this is pretty exciting. I want to I want to learn from these guys. How can I track them down to take lessons? And Max Roach said, too late. They're dead. Right. But he was right, he cut right to the point. 1971, he said, they all died in the early 60s and mid 60s. They're no longer with us. I said, oh boy, I said, I want to learn those techniques. So my next question really kind of impressed Max Roach. I said, well, Mr. Roach, who were their best students? That's a good question. That was the question that Max said, that's where you're going to go. He said, under Billy Gladstone, the best student is Shelley Mann. Under George Lawrence Stone, it's Joe Morello. Under, under Stanford Moeller was Jim Chapin. I said, wow, now... He said to me, the first one to begin with is Joe Morello. I said, oh, man. So now, it's still 1971. I'm 18 years old. And my teacher, Al Miller, who was a Long <laughs> teacher, who was just a great, fantastic teacher. I studied with him for about five years, up until the age of, like, 17 and 18 years old. And he was just so, so inspired and excited about drumming and he would share knowledge all the time just a beautiful guy so buddy buddy rich and al miller were good friends they were both in the marines together and they both were martial art instructors stay tuned next week for part two of episode two on learning to drum